<laughs> I was just about to say hello everyone welcome to yet another LARP podcast and then I got something stuck in my throat so that'll be good for the outtakes hello hello hi everyone welcome in right um, what, are, what are we um what are we doing today what are we talking about what, today matt what are we here for we are finishing off from where we left off finished off last episode okay last stream we were doing character creation and we're sort of finishing that bit off so yep. i think we we basically just squeezed in the nations and the skills um with the idea to now talk about personal resources and then on to sort of the backstory bits so and then that will complete character creation yep sounds good so last time we started creating our brass coast character who's going to be basically a pirate if i remember correctly corsair perhaps a corsair a corsair yep. if we can please um, we didn't actually choose any skills last time, so I've just made a selection. I've decided that our Corsair is going to be uh, an aficionado with weapons, so he's taken Weapon Master. Um, I've given him a bit of fortitude because I only had one XP left and I couldn't get endurance. Um, I've also made him into a bit of a healer. He does have chir the Chirurgeon skill. Um, so he can do basic stuff, but not quite as advanced as a physic, but it might save a life on the battlefield. Uh, and he can call Unstoppable, which is the hero skill, one of the hero skills we learned about last week. So if he's got a weapon master, he could have like a two-handed spear almost. Mm. Pretty cool. Very much so. We'll go over that when we do... Uh, one of the videos we have coming up is all about battles and stuff, and we're going to cover weapons and why the longer they are, the better they are. Yeah. In my opinion. Um, I just feel like a lot of brass freeborn I've seen just like a spear, and it looks really cool. So. Yeah. Yep, very on brief. Hmm. So those are the skills, mm -hmm. and that's where we left off. So. Character. And you've used all your points up, I assume. Yeah? I have used all of my points up cool. um in terms of when we get xp it is after every first and third event so you yeah, get so yeah one xp event e1 after your first after the events after e1 so, yeah. so then you get that fresh xp ready for e2 then after e3 you get another xp fresh and ready for e4 that is uh, assuming your first event is E1 because it's just your first event of the year, isn't it? It's not linked to a specific event. I don't know. I, I believe it's just after your first event and then your third event of the year. Ah, uh, okay. So, but then that will reset at the start of a new year, presumably? Oops. I don't know. I've never done it, but I'd assume so. Yeah, S it makes sense. So really, you should start on an on an E. Three. So if you miss if you miss E one, for example, it's you're not gonna therefore lose the chance of getting two XP a year, right? Uh, yeah, because you'd get it after E two. Yeah, you just need after to do E4. three. Just need to do three events. Hmm. Um. Real. Yeah. So Sam has confirmed it in the chat. Yes. Um. Yeah, so I guess skills selected, quite quite a nice skill set. Um, yeah, obviously, the the idea behind it is um, you can pretty much customize your build to however you want. Um, there's no set way of doing things like a, a lot of video games and and stuff like that. There's you know like power builds and stuff just to get like the. I'm sure. I'm sure. There is in this as well, but um, the main thing to do is to pick skills that you will have fun with. Unless you want to power play it. I don't know if there, if there is much of a power play though, is there? Um, 
No, I mean, I, I'm I'm thinking more maybe for the select few players that put pour everything into hits so they can stand there and be like belted for I don't know fifty hits or whatever and still be standing. I guess that's more of a tank build, isn't it? Technically, but um, uh, we we said in the last episode, there's 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 so many skills, so there's just so much you can play with, really. Like, mm. spec, like, and again, you're not going to be able to do everything with the skill points you've got. No, no, definitely not. Um, we did forget to mention at the start one major development for Yalp is we have a brand new Discord. Mm -hmm. Wow, Discord! Everyone loves a Discord. There's, n if I was to make any kind of factual statement, it's that there's not enough Discord servers in the world. So, I feel like we are doing a service by adding another Discord server to the world out there. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> On a very, very niche subject. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. But, jokes aside, um, it'll be the easiest place to catch uh, when we have new content uh, and we have various places within that Discord for people to chat about uh, each of the different LARP systems that they're into. Um, and we'll, I'm sure, just expand it as we go. Uh, yeah, and as we as we learn about other LARP systems too, because we've got, um, I want I want to learn more about like Curious Pastimes and uh, Lorien Trust and stuff like that. So we've made space for for that. Yep, and um, it's it's a good place for future sort of stream interactions and stuff. If if we want input from the viewer base, it's a good, it's going to be a good place to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that's it, isn't it? Yeah. That's the yeah. So, yeah, I guess join. There is a thing in the chat that will ping up with a link. Um, yeah. So if you go over to that, and then that will kind of send you over to the Discord. Obviously, we've got our Facebook as well. We've got our Facebook page. So if you haven't yes. seen that already, go and like it, because we're going to be um, posting when streams are going live and when the YouTube videos are released, as well as we're going to try to do a bit of a notification, notification through the story section of it um yeah but again like the discord's going to give you notifications on streams and what's coming up as well because we actually do have a bit of a schedule now sort of mm. a bit of a schedule that is an understatement yeah. so schedule wise i guess we could briefly talk about a schedule yeah, yeah. Wise, we've got at least a year and a bit content planned on a two weekly release um mm -hmm. and the next up until the 9th of april is locked in yep. on events um streams so at the moment the easiest place to find that is over on the discord where they're all listed um so yeah jump on the discord but um yeah so it, at least the next three four streams are locked in with pretty much everything else there we just just need to kind of um finalize it yeah, so. I think the the Discord is gonna end up being the the hub of of all the stuff going on with with our with our podcast, really, isn't it? So it's gonna be the one stop place for all of the content, all of the links to all of the places that you can yeah. find us on the internet. Really, it's just gonna be the easiest place for us to interact with you guys. Mm. Um, so yeah, shall we get back on with back on track? Yeah, back on track. So, so territories. Yep. That's going to be the first thing we want to pick, really. Um, I say first. I think it'll be the first thing we cover, but um, we'll go into that first, I guess. So, do you want me to talk about? Happy for me to talk about? Uh, talk? Yeah. I mean, do you want me to give a brief rundown of what they are? There, there may be some viewers that aren't even aware that territories exist within each nation. Uh, or if you're gonna, are you gonna cut? Are you covering? Gonna cover That's that? That's what I was just gonna briefly yeah, explain. Yeah. You do that again. I'll have a hydrate. Uh, have a hydrate. Perfect. So the territories. So all, all nations are broken up into territories. Um, so for example, with our brass coast resident character, and they've got four territories, um, and these are actual parts of the nation, um, and they all have their own sort of buffs and debuffs is that fair to say potentially um so 
you have to have your personal resource based in one of those territories. Um, it's a mechanical thing for the game, so it's not just a fluff reason. It is a mechanical thing, because like I said, um, territories can have sort of resource buffs and debuffs placed in them through game events. Um, and if you have a resource in that territory and it's had this debuff or buff, then you're going to be affected yourself. So you have to select a territory. This can be changed at a later date um, via basically purchasing a resource in a different territory if you wanted. So, for example, if I had a business in Segura, um, I can change my resource in Segura for um, a couple of crowns, I think. You can change it to anything else. However, to actually change it from Segura, I believe you have to basically um, buy a resource located in a different territory. Mm. And the only way I know of doing that is buying it off a player, which is basically done through um, contacting PD and transferring it between players. Yeah, I, I think for for new newer starters though, it's the same rule as what we talked about before. If you were to choose a resource that mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. just don't get on with, or yep. you don't like where you've put it, you can always email PD after your first event and just say, "Look, I'd rather have this moved over here." Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. I I um I mean the first I I heard really about you know buying and selling. Uh, resources in that way was you telling me at the last event that that could happen so i think it's yeah, quite I, a uncommon thing to happen maybe that's a good example is um so a personal resource is obviously something you select um you can upgrade them as well it's not something we've spoken about but you can upgrade these resources um and for example if you die that resource goes um in character or Die. In character, so, yeah, sorry. In character, die. If your character dies or you retire them, your resource goes. Um, however, there is a, basically a way of sort of passing that on, and that's giving it to someone. Or, for example, I bought um, my resource, so I actually bought a congregation of someone because they had a rank two congregation, which is obviously one rank higher than a standard um, starter congregation. So I bought that them. Um, so essentially, we just needed sort of PID numbers through God and um, off you go and change it. So yeah. um, obviously worth knowing where your your resource you're buying is located, because, again, that's going to change your your um, territory that it's based in. Um, so which I don't remember asking, but I'm pretty sure it was obviously I I, um, I bought it for a friend, so I didn't buy it for myself. So um, I, I hope their congregation's going well. I assume it's in Handmark, which is uh, Wintermark territory. So, um, yes, I've gone off on a bit of a tangent there. Um, but it's, it's, it, it, like you said, it is a good yep. example of, of how the mechanic mm -hmm. of buying and selling yep. a, a personal resource works. Yeah, but I thought it was worth mentioning about the territories, because it's only something I sort of just realised, where, for example, like in forgetting the whole, if you're new, you can kind of email it and explain it to PD. Mm -hmm. um any anyone at any point can go change their resource for a couple of crowns you can change it um but to change the territory it's not something you can just pay a couple of crowns for i believe you have to seek out um it in the game that someone's selling your resource in that territory to change territories essentially right um, okay I, I never realized so it's on the wiki i may have got this completely wrong i'm i'm pretty sure i'm right though um so yeah, it's um, that's just an interesting thing. Obviously, it's, it's different from the just changing your um, personal resource. So again, I thought it was worth mentioning. So I guess for exa at the moment, um, we can sort of pick whatever territory we want. Um, if you have a, I guess, a resource in mind, that might influence where you want to, to what territory you want to pick. So if you really wanted a, a fleet, then you're probably going to pick a territory that is on a coastline. Possibly. You don't have to, but it would sort of make sense mechanic. Uh, um, RP-wise. RP-wise, yeah, it would make sense. Um, so that's something to consider maybe when you're picking a territory, but 
Um, I mean, maybe you're picking a forest and you want to look at a map and see where a big wooded area is and go, oh, it makes sense for my forest to be there. Obviously, all the territories are probably going to have woods in, so it's a bit of a pointless comment. But Well, no, yeah, I, might, I, think, I think some territories might struggle to have uh, maybe. forests, yeah, some maybe. of the warmer ones, perhaps. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's... So territory wise, yeah, it's it's a mechanical thing. Um I get it if you have your personal resource based in a certain territory, I don't think that means that's where you reside, you know. So Birchen Hall is based in Hanmark, which is a hall I'm part of, but my territory I believe is Calavesa for my um resource. So again, it's just it's just a mechanical thing for your resource, which is how they can sort of calculate what your resource level is working at, and if there's any buffs or debuffs, essentially. Um, so yeah, that's territories sort of covered. Unless um, anyone's got any more questions, then feel free to check in the chat. But I think yeah, um, mm. it's it's it, it seems to me a mechanical side of it rather than a, a super RP side of it. Um, but again, it's it's. Uh, um, it adds RP by picking one of them because all this now you're linked to that territory. Um, yeah. But yeah. And do you want to cover, I guess, personal resources, or is there anything you want to add to territory? Um, I don't think so. Uh, well, other than the territories themselves can be lost and gained through the the larger wars of the empire. Uh, which will then yep. have an effect on your personal resource if your resource is in the territory that's been lost. So, for example, we recently, I say recently, it's been years, but we lost Surma Suak. And mm -hmm. I think anyone that had a personal resource within Surma Suak had a negative buff. I think, it was it 50% was it reduced? It was either 50% or two-thirds reduced. So, yeah, that's a very good point, what you said, yeah. So, um, losing territories can rinse your... Um, your personal resource um yeah but on the opposite to that is sometimes you can have good buffs happen on a territory which will buff your personal mm -hmm. resource too so i remember my farm or lucan's farm uh had quite a good buff on it for i think maybe a year to two years when we first started just because it was gaining a benefit from um I think it was Blood Red Roads, but I think it's not as it's powerful business. as it was. Blood Red Roads. So, um, yeah, I guess do we want to pick a couple of... Or Rivers Run Red, too, maybe. Yeah, it might, without going too much into buffs and debuffs, yeah, for example, there are things that can buff stuff. Um, one of them are like great works and buildings that can be built in the Empire. Again, I don't want to go too deep into it, but Blood Red Roads was a thing that was built which was to buff... Um, businesses i believe and when you're building one of these buildings you build it in a territory and then if it's a buffing building it will buff the sort of personal resources of that so there's a um i think a terror uh, a place being built currently in calavesa or handmark i can't remember i think it's handmark which will buff herbs for example so anyone who's got a herb garden they're going to get kind of a bit of a herb buff to mm. their income so see so again it's a it's a mechanic in the game for having this territory so that they can assign sort of things to it yeah right um yeah i don't think there's anything else i have on territories yeah the again the, the easiest way to learn about them all is unfortunately to sift your way through the wiki um but it's got some really good information on the, the territories, at least for your nation, are probably good to, to learn about. Um, yeah, and um, I guess if you... Sorry to go back to territories, but if you wanted to min-max it, you could possibly go on the wiki and see what territories in your nation has buildings built in there and buffs going on, and then you can kind of pick and choose and maybe get a bit more out of your, your starting hmm. resource if you wanted to do that. I personally wouldn't bother, but you might do. You know, there's definitely re uh, territories out there with buildings in that are giving extra resources to people. So, yeah, um, I think I think uh, again, everyone will differ. But for me, part of the fun is 
having those negative effects as well as the positive effects to a, yep. a territory um and then by by uh i can't think of the word but uh your resource is then affected by what's happening on the territory yep. um i it think that's fun RP, right? fun flavor for rp and also you you can gain rp effects as well from from what's going on in a territory um yeah so yeah yeah that's true when when there was that really horrendous stuff going on in spiral i think um basically everyone was just like had an rp if anyone who went to fight there had an rp effect that basically super on edge or whatever <laughs> you, you can um you can curse territories so you can curse territories and that gives like yeah there's one um well, I, yeah, I wouldn't go into it, but someone's mentioned it in the chat, actually. Uh, blood, uh, sorry, the rivers run red is a territory curse, they think. It, it prevents wounds healing and stuff like that. Mm. So it basically, I think, mechanically doubles car casualties for armies, I think. I want to say, but I could be wrong. So yeah, that's another mechanic of territories, is it's something that they can sort of, yeah, you can log sort of. Again, buffs and debuffs, that's not necessarily to personal resources, to armies or people inside that nation uh in territory so yeah um shall we bump onto the actual resources now this probably yeah been fair, fairly quick yeah i think we've pretty much come into contact with almost all of these anyway um but straight away the easiest ones for me to always remember because i have one of them is businesses and farms um they straight up just give you cash and i can't describe how good it is to have extra fake IC cash to to use mm -hmm. um uh within the game uh i don't remember the exact amount but it's a lot of crowns. it's a lot of rings sorry nine nine crowns hey there you go nine crowns and most <laughs> alcoholic drinks have five rings uh so as i always think of that as a, as a way to think right i've got 42 pints oh, worth of, of yeah. gold on me you know um yeah yeah sorry so well yeah the only other thing i was going to say is you can um with a farm specifically you can and you can diversify it for a fee uh, and it will produce slightly less gold uh or coin um but you gain the benefit of you can choose like two different herbs that you you get per uh event um, or I think you can change it to to a part forest. Yeah. Um, so there's there's cool things you can do with them uh, in terms of that, and uh, I guess in general for resources you can. This is going on a bit of a tangent, but you can get rituals and stuff that boost them further, so you get even more, uh, more back from them. That's yeah. So I was gonna say. Um that in theory on paper all the resources personal resources earn about roughly the same money right or same value in coin so if you've got a business or a farm or a fleet or a mana site usually assuming how the um sort of the economy and the market's floating they are roughly around the same amount of money so if you had a business and you made your nine crowns and i had a fleet and i had all my resources and sold it I'd probably get about nine crowns worth, if not maybe a smidge more. So, yeah, yeah, they're all roughly the same. So there's, I, I think it's to say if you were to go, oh, which one's the best one to have for the money? It's sort of situational, isn't it? It's, it just sees it's how the game's going. Um, when resources are really expensive, then a resource-heavy um, personal resource is great. When mm. resources are dirt cheap, then having just cash is great. Um, I guess it's also important to mention that everybody starts with 18 rings. So that's down to a territory buff, I believe. Or something like that, maybe an Imperial. Uh, I thought that was just the base amount that every character got. Yeah, you might be right. Um, I was just looking through, all, through my history, actually, on, the, on what exactly it was that was giving me the buffs at the start of my LARP, or Lucan's LARP career. Uh, it was Blood Red Reds like we said, and it was also Brenner's Gift. So at one point I was getting 42 rings from Blood Red Roads and 29 rings from Brenner's Gift, which, you know, 
that's suddenly like nearly four crowns, three, four crowns worth of money. Um, just for having my farm in the right place at the right time. So, um, yeah. I think I think it's because Blood Red Roads, they done the multiple, but they're sort of named the same. So I think mechanically you have a Blood Red Road for businesses and a Blood Red Road for farms, but mm. in character, they're just a really good road system. That I've said more. Um, so you've covered sort of farms and businesses which like you said is great for just having that cash straight away right yes um that is I, that has been briefly touched on in the chat actually sub does say business is good for those not willing or able to deal with trading it's just nice to have money ready to go from the start which i wholeheartedly agree with i find it difficult to trade i find it difficult to approach people and go you want to buy my stuff um yeah. I'm getting better from just from hanging around Sarin and Scal, uh, doing their a lot of their trading stuff. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that's a good point. So it, you know, if people are particularly anxious about going straight in hard trading, then business or farm, I think, are good ones to start with. Sam's asked in the chat about how does coin work. I'm guessing you mean sort of the currency system which I guess we can very briefly touch on right now because we have a whole episode planned on it coming up in a couple of streams' times. Two weeks? Two weeks? No, uh, yeah, four weeks' time. Yeah, so I guess you could say um, the sort of base coin is a ring, right? And like yep. you said earlier, five rings, you're going to buy a pint normally. Um, you get 20 rings in a crown, um, and then you get eight crowns in a throne. And throne's sort of the top coin, isn't it? But obviously they do multiples of the, the, the throne coin. But um, So, for example, if you're getting nine crowns out of a business, um, that's a throne and a crown. So, um, yeah. Money's a weird one to think about because you go off five rings for a pint. But then if you think a season's worth of business is only 42 pints worth, that's a bit weird. So... Well, it's, it's, if, if it's you, hard to really break it down. Like, yeah, you think, I, I mean, if, if we're getting 18 rings, you know, that's three and a bit yeah. pints. So I just think um, I worked out like if you were to say a pint is worth five rings. I'm I'm pretty sure like a throne is worth like 140 quid. Obviously, it doesn't work like that. And that math might actually be wrong. This is from me figuring out ages ago. So, yeah, it doesn't really work necessarily like that because of you know um it's just a weird one but yeah in theory that's how the coins sort of work so mm. um to say you're getting a th thrown in a bit or thrown in a half you know from your resource purse but that's a good that is a good chunk of money for what you need to do like all depends what you're doing if you're drinking eating um or you're sort of buying and selling resources it isn't it's a it's an okay amount of money obviously i i would say you could yeah. You could definitely drink on that on a weekend. And yeah, yeah. I reckon if you got around, you could definitely get food for that as well all weekend. Icy food. I think, yeah, you could drink and eat all weekend mm. um, on, on that alone. Um, which there's people out there that do just drink on that all weekend, you know. Yeah. I, I don't I think there's anyone food. that just eats on it, though, because everyone inevitably ends up at the traders, the food traders. Yeah, although there was that place in Wintermark last time, and they were selling, I think it was two crowns, and they were selling the pizzas, like oven, home, like proper made pizzas, which. Oh, yeah. Maybe two crowns IC wise is expensive, but OC, it's game money. So, yeah, you get a nice sort of nine inch pizza for two crowns. Bargain. Um, mm. I didn't have it, and I wish I did. So, maybe next time, if they're still doing it. Um, and if you have money left. Yes. Yeah, I seem to give away. <laughs> lend my money out or spend it um which is silly so right do you want to talk so, about your resource another tangent tangent but yes let's well um i feel like that's going to be a waffle so do we do you want sh sh i'll talk about mana site or do you want to talk about mana site i'm just thinking let's, let's leave fleet for the end because i'm the most passionate about it Okay, well, fleets and, and military not. units will leave to the end because they, yeah, okay. I think they're kind of similar. Okay, um, I'll I'll talk about mana site, and mm -hmm. then you you can think about dibs in another. One. So, mana sites are uh, basically they produce crystallized mana, 
um, which is used for spell casting and rituals. So crystallized mana is essentially a resource, a physical resource. Or well, it's actually a card in the game, um, but it's something. Yeah, so it's used for magic essentially. If you use rich um, rituals, you'll need uh, crystal mana. Um, if you're spell casting, you can use crystal mana instead of personal mana and stuff. So it's um, it's probably one of the at the moment more expensive resources out there. But again, it fluctuates just based based on what's on the market, what's about. Um, but yeah, this would be almost a go-to for mages because they just get seven mana, I think it is, um, starting off. Yeah, seven mana crystals, starting off, bang, you've got your mana crystals if you want to do a ritual, if you're going to be a battle mage or something, you bang, done. Um, so... You can. Ooh. He's learning stuff on the wiki yes, as we I speak. Am. I think you can basically. <laughs> I think you can put you can put money in to get more mana out. By looks of it. Yeah, is that I similar think. to diversifying? But it's I like a. Know. I'm not going to. I'm not going to read it because it just. I will just be zoned out for like two minutes. But um, it sounds like yes, you can buy more mana which it seems very expensive way of doing it but if you've got too much coin and not enough mana it's worth it so and not again, enough it sense. Depends. yeah not enough sense it all depends where the mana is at so on the mana on the wiki what it just said you can buy that i've seen it more expensive that again at the moment it's a bit lower but so yeah that, that's that's mana sites i think if you just want your mana crystals for your mage stuff it's a good one to go for um so mm. yeah that that is mana sites um again if any questions check it in the chat but yeah, I and again, think, we'll simple one. Yeah, and we'll we'll cover, mm -hmm. I guess, mana in more detail when we uh, talk about spell casting in a future episode. Yeah, because that will it requires the use of mana, so we'll cover that. Um, herb gardens. Yeah, they are very popular in our hall. Um. Mm -hmm. And for good reason. It basically, if you're going to be doing any kind of healing, uh, more than get off the ground, you're going to be all right. Um, herbs are, are the way to go. Um, so to start off with, you get um, quite. I'm just looking up the herbs that you get. It's a lot more than I thought it was. Six doses of True Vervain, two doses yeah. of Cerulean Mazarine, two doses of Blade Root. Two doses of Imperial Rose Wield and two doses of Marowort. And all of those herbs do different healing things, which we'll cover in our upcoming healing video. We've got a lot of upcoming stuff and it all ties in. Um, but that's the base amount of herbs that you'll get. Um, which, like you said, Matt, um, generally that'll probably work out roughly the same value of a farm or the amount of mana crystals that you'd get from a mana site. Um, you can actually get a higher yield from your herb gardens during downtime again by spending money. Yes, I think one of our pool mates did that fairly recently. I think maybe or they never did and they went to. I think um, yeah, it's something I just recently heard of and I was like, that's a really good idea. You just pay four crowns, I think. Am I right to say that? Uh, six get... crowns. Six crowns. So. Again, it's probably more um, for RP fun. Um, so Sam's just said that money thing was down to an opportunity. It's not a usual thing. Oh, okay. They should probably take it out of the main page then. Or at least yeah. put this is temporary. Um, but yeah, you can also upgrade Herb Garden with force resources, which we'll cover in our e uh, economy episode. Um uh Oh, hang on. I've also I've had someone now say that is actually a thing. Six crowns. It's not an opportunity. It's standard. So, okay, we were slightly right. Um, I guess upgrading resources is something we can touch on once we've finished yeah. chatting about resources. Yeah. 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 Um, other than that, that's uh, that's herb gardens. Herb gardens for herbs. I'll dive into congregation then. Um, so. Congregation is 
Um, I'll just read the wiki on this one because I don't know much about congregations, even though yep. I bought one. Neither of us so, really know anything about it, but we uh, have what I think is a, a couple of good guests lined up for some of our uh, religion and conversation about the way and yep. what it is to be a priest. Yep, yep, again, coming up. Um, so a congregation can represent almost any structure or location where people could receive spiritual instructions, such as a monastery, a church, a sacred grove, a burial site, or a similar structure. So um, this is obviously religious faith, religion focused. Um, it provides the owner with Liao and votes to the, use an imperial synod. So Liao is used, is, is a physical resource, a block you get, I believe, and that is used for sort of spiritual religious um, skills. Okay, so um, that's what Liao is used for. This is how you get Liao. Um, and then going into... So this is one of the only resources I think you do get less value out of. But that's because half of the resource is covered by Synod votes, which is a whole other thing of. Again, we'll learn in the in the um, our religion episodes. But the Synod is um, a place where all the sort of religious and priests and stuff meet up and things kind of go through it, I guess, um, a bit like the Senate where you're proposing things to be, uh, maybe they're passing new sort of religious laws or rules. I'm not doing this any justice because I don't know anything about it. Um, but when you vote on it, for example, um, if you've got a congregation, you can vote and the higher your ranked congregation through upgrading it, you get more votes and therefore you get more weight to your vote. So... Um, yeah, more voting power. Yeah. Um, yeah, essentially. So, I'm again, I haven't really done a good job on explaining it, but um, uh, I guess I've just seen something here on the wiki as well. So, um, it's possible to sell the Liao you make on your congregation in downtime and you receive one crown for each dose you sell. So, hmm. um, there's a lot more to this. Um, personal resource maybe i should cover um i tell I, you what I, I won't because we can actually kind of cover this in our religion stuff so there's yeah. more you can do sort of downtime related to this personal resource which is down to um yeah doing stuff sort of with synod and religious religion stuff so um yeah it's it's a, another sort of more in-depth one and i think that's why you don't get as much monetary value out of it when it comes to resources because there's a whole other side to that resource yeah i think it's it leans heavily on the role-playing fun that the the player gets out of it as opposed to a financial gain in character yeah it, it's, it's going to be keyed up a lot more which i think the religious game by design is very in-depth on because this the whole world we live in is very religious focused you know that's the, the cornerstone of the empire so um mm. yeah this is yeah like i said it, it's focused more role playing and there's plenty of role playing to do so yeah this is it's it's, it's a priest game priests so yeah yeah <laughs> on to another one that i don't know very much about uh is military units i don't know have you ever had a military unit no. None of your uh, characters have ever had a I military think, unit? I think... Uh, no, I haven't. Um, hmm. No, I've, I've only ever had fleets, I'm afraid. It um, it sounds pretty cool. Uh, we, I speak to a, a lot about them uh, to, to some of the people in our hall. Um, but you can do quite a few different fun things with them. Um, a lot of it during downtime, uh, I guess, if not all of it. Um, yeah. They're basically, uh, well, there's four different things you can do by the looks of it here. I'm just going to lean on the wiki to have a look at this. Uh, you can take an independent action. So uh, they'll always be able to choose to take paid work or other options may be available depending on the campaign. Um, so that basically means if there's stuff going on plot-wise in the main event of Empire, it may give you additional ways that you can use your military unit so if there's a particular raid going on i imagine it's probably the same as a, a, a fleet in that sense that you would get 
special missions. Downtime. So I think it's worth saying that a military unit, its core, it represents a, a, a group of skilled soldiers that you command, right? So yeah. Oh yeah. Wiki, yeah. On the wiki, it says. It could be as little as a dozen elite warriors or a hundred regular soldiers. Um, so, yeah, it represents a band of troops, and then you can kind of do stuff with that mechanically in the game, like you just said, where you can kind of attach them to armies or fortifications, mm. um, or you can put them to work, like you just said, which gets you coin. Yeah, you can also send them off to scout, form reconnaissance yeah. in a territory or region. Um, I assume that gives you potential plot in your pack so yeah so scout an area is linked to spy networks so spy networks are buildings that can be built in <clears throat> can't remember it's friendly territory or enemy territories and um, basically if you have a certain amount of military units assigned to it it will dictate sort of how much information you get from it so if you have you need a base amount of military units in the spy network to gain some information and if you kind of it goes up in tiers and the more you assign to to it the more information you get out of it yeah i th and i think in terms of the kind of monetary reward or resource reward you get from military unit stuff depends on the imperial guerdon yeah so there will be a percentage amount of that divvied out to everyone that's gone on particular missions um and stuff like that so it, it fluctuates between events basically there's no set amount reward for from having a military unit sometimes it can be very good sometimes it could be not so good we've seen in our experiences of hallmates like one season having three crowns out of the imperial good and other seasons having like a couple of thrones so yeah it can vary a lot and it's safe to um something to say as well that the imperial guardian however you want to pronounce it is actually it's something that's selected um so you can have multiple armies fighting or multiple things going on, whereas the Imperial Garden, the Guardian, sorry, I, I believe, can be kind of selected to one of them. Um, so that's where you get like a lot of military units sort of focused to, um, to maybe follow the Imperial Guardian just to get a bit of pay out of it. So if you if you go off on a military campaign that's not supported by Imperial Guardian, you're not going to get money from the imperial guardian so that's something that's mm. worth bearing in mind with a military unit um you might find sometimes you're not actually going along with the imperial Guardian, so you're not going to get much money yeah um which might influence sort of what you're doing with your military unit but mm. yeah cool and then on to a similar one but you're you're going to be oh. the person to know for this one shall we should we quickly do forest and mines because they're very oh yeah i forgot about forest and mine actually they're extremely similar so mm. we can i guess we can just both talk about it. so forest and mines um a forest is a resource which you take um i don't know if you want to click on it on the on the character creation you're doing um but basically you can click on it and it will give you an option of what you want oh yeah, we've been <laughs> we've been so long it's logged me out <laughs> So forests uh, create resources, um, physical resources, and that will be sort of forest relating stuff, related stuff. So you'll get um, a, a choice of up to a, a choice of four resources to select, and your forest will produce that resource. So those resources: amber gelt, beggar's lie, dragon bone, and iridescent gloaming. Unfortunately, um, when I click on it, it doesn't show the drop down on the stream for some reason. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah. So you click the you click forest. That's what I want as a resource. You click, you drop down. You can select which one of them to go for. Again, um, it's going to give you. I'll, I'll tell you how much exactly what it's giving you. Um, I think it's going to give you twelve measures of any of the chosen material you select. So it's going to give you 12. Again, if you want to min, min max it, you could kind of figure out what's valuable at the moment and select that. But they're all valuable. They're all going to sell. Um, so that's forest, essentially. You can select any of them. Um, it can be diversified. So you can select the production of one material for another. Um, so basically, you can kind of get rid of two. So if you have an amber gelt forest, 
you can diversify it so you lose two amber gout out of your total pot so but you'll gain two of another selected material so mm. kind of get away of sort of splitting it slightly which is handy um that's about it i think for that um down yeah. tops it's possible to harvest so, so you can Okay, so you a bit like herbs, you can spend six crowns in downtime to get five additional measures of the material that you naturally produce. So yeah, again, this is this would be handy for sort of artisans and stuff or traders in general, mm. where you're just going to get a lump of this resource so that you can go out and sell or use. So I think it's a pretty good introduction to trading actually by having those smaller resources to to trade. It's what if I was a trader? Well, I mean, yeah, there's you can do lots of trading, but yeah, I think mine, forest, or fleet would be ideal for sort of trading because you're just going to get a bunch of resources that you've got now got to physically go out and sell or use or whatever. So, yeah, um, um but it's yeah, it's, it's handy, yeah. In terms of a mine, it is, I can confirm, exactly the same in terms of you get 12 of the resource, uh, you can spend six crowns to get an additional five of any of the resources. You can upgrade it like everything else, and you can diversify it in the same way as a forest. Uh, and the four, the four uh, things you can get from a mine is green iron, tempest jade, welt silver, and orichalcum. Yep. So and again, they're pretty similar. Again, they're they're physical items you have as well. They're physical items you can hold and. Yes, I be bag. I believe Ed is gonna show us. Uh, he's got one of every resource. Fizz he Rex. does. Um, so he's going to show us on the economy, Imperial Economy stream episode that we plan on doing. Mm. Which isn't too far away. Doesn't um, have the 100 throne coin yet, though, unfortunately. You no, won't get to see um, that. He was after a 5 throne coin last event, and I used... I had two, and I used... I think I ended up swapping... and let, So he had one. I can't remember now. Ah, uh, no. Um, but he was after it. So I guess we're finishing on the last one, which is Fleet. Yeah, maybe we'll talk about fleets, then we'll have a drink break. You don't like your throat's about to fall out? No, um, well, sh shall we talk about fleet, talk about buffing resources, and then we'll go for a drinks break? Yeah. Because then that's sort of resources sort of done. Yeah. Um, so what is a fleet? A fleet represents one or more ships. It could be a large swift vessel or a fleet of half a dozen smaller vessels. So it's kind of what you want to role play. Uh, my character my ship fleet is just sort of a one biggish ship um, called the Thunderchild, which, um, yes. Oh, did you name that? I did name it. Oh, I didn't know you could name them. That's cool. I mean, it's RP, right? It's, it's whatever you want to call it. Well, yeah. I, yeah, I guess so, yeah. A ship has a name. Uh, and I, role-playing wise, I bought a ship called the... Oh, I can't remember now. The, the Wandering Gunny or something like that named after Gunnarsvard himself oh, yeah. and gifted it to Tor Gunnarsvard who now has a fleet but that's ah awesome. that's how you tied in the fleet that's cool mm. so um, and yeah he's basically like I thought I'd help him out and then he kind of just it's more old RP but anyway we're getting, I'm, I'm getting distracted so um, a fleet is many things which we'll cover quickly so a fleet can um, do many options in downtime. It can trade with any foreign nation port. So it can't trade with the Empire itself, but it can trade with any foreign nations. Um, and those foreign nations, I think we... Oh, we haven't covered. So they basically are sort of NPC foreign nations out there that we all have relations with. Um, they'll, they'll close ports with you or open them up depending on how happy they are with the empire so we we annoyed a few a while back and now they won't trade with us um each military uh, each port gives different resources normally you'll get a selection of loads of different ports so if i click on one we'll quickly so we'll go with what i normally trade with which is axdos which is a foreign nation they've got two ports open to the empire currently it's isik i don't know how to pronounce that i-s-s-y-k and cantor um, and these two different ports will give you a load of different items so cantor which is the one i normally go to they give you beggar's lie mana crystals 
coin, so money, Auric Alchem and Tempest Jade, and you'll get sort of a selection of that. E normally equal in about, you know, just over a throne or a throne and a half worth of value. Um, but then if you were to go to Valyridan in the Commonwealth, that gives you Beggar's Lie, Blade <clears> Root, which is a herb, Green Iron and Tempest Jade. So less choice, but so yeah, it's it's you can get this is all on the wiki, accessible to available trading ports. So when I first started playing the game, there must have been about eight or nine tradable ports. Now we've only got six, and that's down to wars and sort of imperial relations. Oof. Um, yeah. So trading. Let's so, say yeah, different ports give you different things. I trade with Axos one because it sort of gives me a nice selection of resources I like, but also role playing reasons I do it. Um, so, but yeah, there's if you kind of have a look on the wiki and go through it and see which one you find useful. For example, Scal in our hall, he likes trading with Cantor and Axos as well because it gives him mana crystals and he uses those mana crystals to do rituals um, to buff our leaders. So, um, you've got trading. I think I'm pretty much done with covering trading. Um, you can privateer, which tends to be um, so you can. Privateer provides a standard return based on the rank of fleet, but other independent actions do not provide any returns by default. So make sure you check the production is shown when you select an action from the drop down point. So privateering, I think, is what you select if there's any sort of special events popping up. So there might be special actions that happen in the game, and you can select them with um, privateering. So similar to an independent action on a military unit, then. I believe so, yeah. Um, I get, it's not something I've done, but any, so so if we look at privateering, any fleet can choose to engage in privateering. This happens automatically if the owner does not select any other option. So during downtime, if you don't select any option, um, they'll just change it to privateering. The unit has an equal chance of gaining herbs, ingots, or measures, money, or crystal mana as a result of this action, as if it was appropriate resource equivalent level. So you're free to roleplay the details of this attack as you wish, as it does not impact the ongoing campaign. Please bear in mind, however, that you cannot use this action to commit to piracy against nations that empire is not at war due to the presence of the civil <clears throat> service observers. At the present, this means that it's not possible for Imperial fleets to attack the ships of the Grendel. This state of the affairs will continue as long as the peace treaty endures. So I guess if you privateer, it'll just give you a bunch of random resources. In a nutshell. <laughs> Yes, so I, I didn't really know enough about it, so I I wanted to read that. Is um, it not is it not something that you have done with your resource very much? Privateer? No, I haven't privateered. I've done mm. um sort of special events, but I haven't selected privateer necessarily. So I haven't because privateer again, you can kind of role play that as oh I, you know, pick an enemy nation that we're at war with and just say yeah I went and sunk a couple of their ships and took a load of booty. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's kind of an RP thing and just gives you a bunch of random resources, which could be handy. Um, I guess then you can sort of do military actions as well. Um, so this can be done in sort of special, again, special events that come up throughout the game. So um, you can kind of... I'm just going to look now. So... Yeah, so a navy, you can support navies. Um, so again, kind of like a military action, they have a military uh, military value. Um, so you can kind of support imperial navies. I don't believe there is a current imperial navy at the moment, um, but we do have sort of special events that come up. So there was one recently where fleet captains were asked to sort of transport and ferry um, civilians and no military units to attack a certain nation. Um, so if you went and did that as a military um, a navy naval captain, you kind of got a bit of, of money. Um, and again, there is the, this also comes into the Imperial Guardian as well, if you're supporting um, mm. a certain military campaign. Um, and then there's another one as well, which is, I guess you could kind of say it's spy network related. I, I don't think mechanically it is, but... I, what my fleet has just done is um, we're mapping a uh, part of um, a coast, so, so a part of the map. We're, we're, we're going out there and sort of mapping it. So we, it's unknown to us currently. And the idea is if you get a certain amount of fleet 
captains to go along and do it, um, then the Empire are now going to be aware of this new territory or this new coastline or something like that. So that's what I'm currently doing. I think pay-wise, I'm not going to get much coin out of it at all, but I will get a physical map that supposedly, I, I've never done it before, but this is what I've been told. You'll get like a physical map showing what you've done, um, which is kind of cool, quite interesting. So that's something else fleets do. I personally think fleets have got loads to do, and it's quite interesting to me. It's like, it leaps out. This is why my second character has got a fleet again, just because I think they're so much fun. Um, you can do so much with it. You can trade with lots of people, which kind of you can role play, um, privateering, yeah. So yeah, it's quite a versatile resource to have, I think. Yes, it is. Uh, and again, like if you're if you're an artisan, it's really handy to have because you're gonna get a load of bunch of resources. If you're just mm. a trader in general, it's handy to have because you can get a bunch of resources. Um, so yeah, it's it's um, it's yeah, versatile. I think is the word for it. Yeah. So. How can we make these resources better? Do you want to talk about boss and I'll talk about rituals? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So when you say boss, you mean uh, doing the upgrades on yeah. on stuff. Yeah. So um, another... It's class as a resource, but it's not a personal resource. Um, but another type of currency let's say uh they're, they're called boss resources they are the creme de la creme of uh um things to to own in empire i would say um what have we got white granite weirwood mithril mm -hmm. they're the three ones the three the three uh the three ones to have um you can basically spend a number of these to you can do a lot of stuff with them. A lot of um, construction works and stuff throughout the Empire require them. Um, but in this instance, you just need a few of them uh, to upgrade your resources. And that will allow your resource to uh, produce more stuff. Um, financially, <laughs> it's probably not worth it. But it's great for, for RP because... Um, well, I, you can you can say, oh, I've managed to extend the wing of the herb garden so we can now produce more herbs. And it's something that you can talk about with other people. It's something you can talk about uh, around the camp with your uh, with your group. Um, I decided when I if I upgrade my fleet, when I upgrade it, I'm going to purchase another ship. So I'll have two ships instead of just the one. So that's how I would role play it. Or you yeah. could kind of role play it as... You know, you just bought a bigger ship, maybe. Um, yeah. It's quite easy for, for me with a farm. We've acquired a new field. <laughs> yeah. So, or, yeah. There's I, guess, a... yeah I guess you could be like, we've got better tools or something like that. It's, yeah. it's kind of anything you want to make out of roleplay-wise, isn't it? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the, 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 all the farmers have had yeah. training, so they're uh, they're able to increase the yield or, or anything like that, really. Exactly that, Um yeah. So that's how and you would upgrade them with uh, with boss resources. And I guess safe to say you can upgrade your resource basically as many times as you want, but you can only upgrade it once per season. And it to the the cost of boss resources it takes to upgrade that increases with every level, right? So yes, to to upgrade it to level two you need one boss resource. To upgrade it to level three you need two. So it suddenly gets quite expensive to upgrade it and. Like you said, you've touched on it. it the boss resources are very expensive to buy. The return of upgrading a resource isn't very much at all. Yeah. So, um, um, so it, to start off with, is actually two uh, wanes for the first upgrade. Sorry, yeah. So it's quite yeah. it is quite expensive. I mean, yeah. on average, let's say the boss resources are five thrones each ish, with fluctuations. Um, so you're looking at ten thrones just to upgrade it. A farm, for example, which will get you an extra 36 rings every event. Yeah. Which it, is, yeah, so it's mad. Which is an but eighth of a throne. An, interest, yeah, an interesting thing I've heard on it, where people were saying how, like, obviously when the game started, boss resources were a lot cheaper. So mm. it, this this inflation has purely come from players. Yeah. Which, again, is a really cool idea with how the economy works in Empire. You know, that it grows and swells like that. Um so yeah, that's 
yeah, so that's why it's at the moment it's not really worth doing, but maybe back in the day when it was dirt cheap, well, I say dirt cheap to buy Borsa Resource, when it was under throne to buy resource, Borsa Resource, it was sort of worth it. So Yeah, so, but do you, do you think that it should have been amended, or do you think it's better for it to be super overinflated? I, think, I don't think it should be amended. I think maybe... I, I don't know, it's, it's a tricky one because I would say don't amend how much it upgrades your resource by. What they need to do is put more boss resources into the game to bring the price down. But then if you put more boss resources in, into the game, then the Empire can do a lot more construction-wise, maybe. And therefore then that's possibly going in the direction they don't want it to. So it's a tricky one. Like, uh, at this point, yeah, it almost seems point. Unless you get given a load of boss resources for free, then there's no real point in upgrading your resource financially. Like, if you were to min max it, it's not worth it. But if mm. you just want to do it for the prestige and the roleplay, which I guess is sort of half the game, then yeah, definitely do it. So, I know last event, two of our people in our hall have upgra upgraded their resource. Um, Scow really wants to do it. I would like to do it if I had the cash to do it. Um, so maybe next year I might look at doing it, but at the moment, no. But I guess it's more prestige for me. I would do it out of prestige to go, yeah, I've got a rank. You know, if I could get to a rank five fleet, that would be really cool in my in my head. So, um, I guess I'll touch on rituals then, if you're happy to move on. Yep. Yeah, I think that pretty much covers the upgrades are fairly straightforward um, because you just so use balls. Yeah. Um, rituals then, to say it really simple, you can use ritual magic to target a player or a territory, and that will buff a certain re personal resource in that in that territory, essentially. So um, if I were to talk about fleet, there's obviously herb, well, let's say herb gardens in, for, for example, in the winter realm magic, um, you there's a spell, uh, a, a ritual there, which costs four mana to cast uh, well eight mana to cast technically without going into too much detail um costs eight mana to cast and that will bump up your herb garden by five levels for one season so essentially that's going to double your output of your herb garden um and that'll do it for one season so what you kind of see a lot is every season people will go out and buff their resource so i do it with my fleet every season i'll buff my fleet up um just because that's given me twice the amount of resources i'm getting normally um you know and with fleets and military units that will bump up its military value as well so in principle yeah in theory that there's rituals out there and with fleets mm. as well um i can bump my fleet up for its trade value so it'll bump it up five levels for trade or I could do a different ritual and it'll bump up its um, value by five for privateering. Um, or I can bump it up for spy networks. Um, so yeah, there's just lots of different rituals and essentially it will buff. Um, and there are rituals for debuffing as well. So there's, uh, in fact, I'm just looking at one now for fleets. Um, there's a ritual that will reduce production by three quarters for a year. So is that so, like a curse? I I'd imagine yeah, essentially. So I'll click on it. It is um it is it is a curse, yeah. Mm. So yeah, um there is ways of debuffing personal resources as well. Um again in game, but yeah, ritual wise, yeah, rituals are, there's a lot of rituals. So every personal resource in the game there is a ritual somewhere in one of the realms that will buff it. So winter can buff military units and herb gardens. Autumn buffs fleets. I think summer can buff fleets um another realm can buff military units i think so yeah there's there's plenty out there to buff uh, personal resources through rituals yeah. and it's 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 a more affordable way of doing it so i sort of min max it figuring out maths um it's going to cost me five mana to buff my fleet well yeah I, uh, without going into the mechanics of the game and why it costs this, we'll, for now we'll just say it cost me five mana to buff my fleet, and I'll get back about five mana's worth of resources. Yeah. So, 
you know, sometimes it doesn't work out like that. You might find you're spending a bit more mana to get not as much resources, but it's exchanging mana for resources, which for me, I like getting all these resources because I'll go trade them. So, um, mm. and get get again with her gardens, it costs you four mana and you're getting about that in her value. I found again, it all dependent on values and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I found the, um, the farm buff that I've been doing throughout the year, um, to be quite beneficial. I think I ended. I think it. I was up maybe one or two thrones by the end of the year, and it would have been more if there wasn't a horrendous curse on um, farms at the time. Well, not the curse. It was that flood. I think wasn't it? Flood, the yeah, the flood. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, I think a lot of them. It, it obviously it all depends on the cost of mana crystals. If mana crystals are really expensive, it's going to be less worth doing. But if they're really cheap, then yeah, you're making making bank. So. Yeah, that's pretty much it on rituals, I think. Um, yeah. We'll have a, I guess we'll have a quick break and then come back and look at the last little section of character creation. Cool. Peridian asked a really interesting question that I think would be fun to talk about. And I think it's something you guys can answer too. The LARP is in the chat, that is. Uh, is there a certain favorite character that you like to play? Uh, or do you change with each um, with each play? So for Empire specifically, um, the character doesn't change unless your character dies in battle or you decide to retire it. Um, some people like to go through characters quite quickly. Other people, like me, <laughs> I gr have grown attached to the first character that I played in Empire. Um, and it's until I guess until this year, it's been difficult for me to think about ever playing anything else. Um, but um, it's hard to say if I have a favorite. It's um, like I, I re obviously I really like Lucan because he's the first LARP character that I've ever played. Um, but I have enjoyed some of the other characters that I've done for other LARPs, um, particularly <laughs> the the, uh, the Halfling LARP uh, Second Breakfast at ILARP. Um, that was extremely, extremely fun, <laughs> being a Halfling for a weekend, basically just eating, drinking, dancing, partying, um, going on ridiculous adventures to find mushrooms for like a pie that we have to bake. Um, I think Tom and, well, if, if Cass is in the chat, they, they will agree that we had a very fun weekend that weekend. Um, so, yeah, that was a particularly good one. Uh, and I also, re I, I quite like playing our, uh, the the Winters Clan, which is our, um, our, uh, sort of they're not they're not official npcs within the 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 flying it's flying lead at ilarp it's a cowboy themed lap um they're not official npcs but the winter's clan which was just all of us pretending to be related i guess and also really young for some reason i don't know how that came about i'm assuming it was alcohol induced but like <laughs> the, the oldest person in our in our group was i think Cass, who was supposed to be like 19 <laughs> Or something um it was sort of like the elder of the of the group um but playing playing that group with everyone together is really fun because it's just just a silly a silly cowboy time um but yeah i don't know it, it's hard to i can't obviously i can't pick a favorite character for empire because i've only ever played one um but i'm not sure about a favorite all-time larp character that i've played I don't know the hobbit one I th it might have to be my hobbit character halfling character sorry don't come after us tolkien estate um i can't even oh, remember <laughs> yeah. i can't even um i can't remember my character's name now that's bad considering i've just said it's one of my favorite but um yeah. Oh, yeah. The barman in Valhalla. I forgot about that. I um sort of managed to briefly play 
the the barkeep for a player that had in character died. This is at the this is another ILARP game where it's it's Viking themed. Um, and when the character dies, they're they're led into the uh, into the tavern where <laughs> there was just a bunch of us. We were all crewing for for that one. Um, there was just like people fake fighting. There was loads of people like drinking, um, like eating and stuff. And it was supposed to be like Valhalla, um, and that was fun to play the barkeep for that. I kept sort of handing them drinks that they were, you know, pretend downing uh, and then telling us the story of how they died. And we were all like, Wah! that was a fun little moment. Oh, yeah, Rudderbutt. That was my halfling character. He's great. That was a really good one. I'm looking forward to the next one. I make it. What about you, Matt? What are your because you've had a few Empire. Well, two, three. How many Empire characters have you been through? Well, I said I'm on my second. Oh, okay. Not as bad as I thought. No. Um, what's my favourite character? I guess I've only had three Lark characters. Two Empire, Shifty Winters, Saren, and Ferris, I guess. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I think I enjoy my current Empire character because I feel like I'm achieving things. Um, Shifty was just really silly. Oh, was Shifty was great. Flying, flying lead character. So that was fun. It's just a bit of silliness. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I haven't had much luck. I'm trying to think, I've done anything else. I don't think I have. So yeah, yeah, I think it's just yeah. I guess my current character because I'm sort of invested in it and going where I want to go with it. So, you know, my last character, my first Empire character, I didn't really know where I wanted to be or where to go. And um, so I didn't really get anywhere, really. You know, I had a, a very slight idea of something and then my character died. So um, yeah. I guess my current character, because like I have a plan and I can kind of see it and um, like working. So um, I think yeah. I think you've you've done well with Saren, I think out of. Like our our lot, he's I he's the most, I guess, developed. I would say. Like Lucan, does nothing basically, you know. He runs the hall. <laughs> well, yeah, he, he's he's just a figurehead. I think um, yeah, I think I think Saren's like, you've you just got really stuck in with him, um, mm. and that's sort of paying off, kind of with your your Senate stuff. Yeah, vote for Saren. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I think I think Saren. I think I said it before that the character I started off deliberately putting myself out of my kind of comfort zone. <clears throat> yeah. Um, and I, I still very much fall into that with this current cat. But I, yeah, I'm kind of I'm deliberately trying to put myself out there because I guess with Empire LARP, it's it's about who you know not necessarily what you know so you just it's in my experience anyway it's kind of like just get out there and know people the more mm. people you know the things start happening so that's where my, that's my mentality of it is try try just go out talk to people befriend people you know of high, in high position and then you'll it will fall in your lap hopefully yeah fingers yeah. crossed we'll see. but yeah um yeah i think i'm enjoying that one the most at the moment hmm but again, it... I don't really do any other laps, so it's hard to say. Yeah, I guess so. Ask us in a year's time. <laughs> Let's see how many characters we've gone through. Um, we've got a second question. I think we've got time. I think we'll only need about thirty minutes for the for the the details mm. bit, won't we? I just started looking at it, but okay. Go on. Oh, really? <laughs> um, I thought it was right a bit of backstory, but it's not. I don't know. Yeah, let's go for it. Question, it. question it up. Yeah, I mean, we don't have to write the backstory. We can talk about what a person needs to do to write a backstory. Um, yeah. So you can answer first this time. What's your favourite monster orc that you've played or made a small backstory for at Empire for a big battle? I never have. Easy. Next. Easy. Easy answer. Um, I immediately think of the least favourite orc that I ever played, and that was when I was real sick 
for no reason. Like, I don't know what was going on, but I was having a real bad time. <laughs> and we had to sit down for ages waiting for the players. And I was just getting to the point where I was, like, getting delusional. I thought someone had, like, called over specifically for me um, for, like, a phone call or something. I was just like, yeah, I need to not be in a, a latex mask right now. But it, it wasn't it wasn't alcohol induced or anything. And I remember going and just, I think, sleeping for a couple of hours. And then I felt right, it was rain. That was my least favorite time as a, as a monster orc. But um, I think um, it's, it's got to be whenever we play as uh, the spider, spider, I was going to say the spider daddies, but the, ignore that, the, the, the druge. <laughs> um, uh, I can't remember them. I can't remember what they're called, but they they sort of favour uh, our halogen, which is like a spider. Spider, dude, yeah. Spider druge, spider druge, etc. But yeah, we had like little fake um, cobwebby things and stuff that we would just like put on downed players and stuff. Um, very think, fun. Yeah, I think my favourite experience monster has been druge because. And you can be a bit more, like, annoying as a monster. You know, you don't have to, like, form a wall and fight the Imperials. Like, we we tend to kind of splinter off and go sort of ambushing and trying to pick off people that have kind of strayed too far from the, the herd. So, yeah, yeah it's, um, it's that's fun. I, I enjoy that side of it. And, um, yeah, I was just going to say, when you said, like, oh, what's your favourite cast? Like, We've done it a few times with like Yarl Choda, for example. Like we kind of go a bit silly with monstering, but I kind of find myself going a bit too serious with it. Like when I'm monstering, I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I'm I'm out to kind of I just all I want to do is down Imperials. Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, like I'm trying to play like master tactician in my head of like, oh yeah, let's bait this person out and then we'll quickly cut them down and then run away. You know, so rather than just having a laugh monstering i kind of <laughs> overthink it and i'm like because it I, like, I find it fun when you know you're trying to bait imperials away and they, they just want to go hit you with their, their sword because <clears> you're being annoying but then also you're like yeah like i'll pull you away from your mates and then they're conscious of it and it's just trying to get them it's just trying to pull them away mm. like like i think last battle was one of the funnest i think it was me you ed and maybe sam i think it was yeah, it was me and... In the woods. Uh, no, may maybe Max, actually, yeah. And it was, like, four of us at one point, and we had, like, two high guard, I think it was, and we were, like, trying to pull them away from them. They'd literally, like, we'd run up to them, start hitting them, they'd, like, pull them slightly away from their line, and then we'd just bolt and run mm. away. So then they'd sort of run after us and then realise that we'd turn around and try... So then they'd have to run away, and we were just doing that the whole time. And it's, like... <laughs> I guess it wasn't proper fighting, but it's just really annoying for the Imperials. But I feel like... When you're actually fighting, that is a tactic. That's what I would do if I was actually trying to fight in a battle. You know, I wouldn't just try form a shield wall. I would try pull people out. You know, pick off one person and then everyone just jump on them and beat them up. And then and we, yeah. it worked really well. Like a couple of times, we I think we downed two or three people, but then mm -hmm. had to run away and they got healed up, which was a shame. But yeah, I feel yeah. I'd it's just, it's just about just about giving that sense of peril isn't it to the to the players yeah it's, it's getting the players worried which you know i think i really i would like to do more fighting i just don't enjoy it as my character because it's not really what my character's doing yeah um whereas monsters you can be a bit more uh, risky you know whereas like if i went onto a battlefield as my character like i don't really want to fight as my character you know, I don't enjoy fighting as Imperials because the way Wintermark fight, it's not really for me. Um, and it only takes one mistake and then your character's done, which you've invested in. You know, which yeah. I guess you should always have that risk, you know. You can't just wrap yourself in bubble wrap and never die. But at the moment, I'm like, I don't really want to... I'm at a point where I, I don't want to fight because um, I just don't enjoy it. I think it's fair. Um, whereas I'll monster when I can, you know. Yeah, um, because I enjoy that side of it of no, no risk, no stress. I can just run around and fight. Hmm. Um, but yeah, I haven't actually monstered for quite a while. No, so me I, neither. I, yeah, I thought it would be a good idea to sort of step back from monstering, whereas now I'm kind of actually I want to go back to it. So, right, yeah, that's 
Moment. Anyway, that's question time. Thanks for the questions, uh, everyone. So, final, final page of uh, character creation. This is all about the uh, the identity of your character and sort of rounding out uh, the role playing element of it. I would say. Yeah. Um. And this is where the wiki is super helpful. Yes. Example, the wiki has everything, look and feel, people, culture, customs, and stuff like that. So, for example, we want to... What are we going to name our character? Well, well, if you go on the wiki, it will tell you how they figure out namings for the Brascos. I was going to ask if that was on there, because that's kind of there. vital. So, um, freeborn names are primarily Spanish slash, uh, slash Mexican in flavor, with Moorish influence and it will give you some sample names as well and sort of how they came to that which is and also different archetypes in the nation will have use sort of different naming processes for brass coasts is so yeah it's kind of interesting so there's a couple of sample names in there i won't try to pronounce them because i can't is this um, is this the archetypes that you're trying to pronounce no sample names oh okay so sorry yeah, sorry, I just focus on the name for now. But yeah, sort of. But yeah, me Spanish, Mexican flavored names. Okay. So I'm trying to think of any names off the top of my head that I know. Um, uh, there's little Sam's character, and I forget his name. I've but got, I've got some someone names. will put it in the chat shortly. I've got some names written down in my sort of notebook, which I don't have in front of me, but it's like. Yeah. The I in freeborn names. Aurelio. Aurelio. Aurelio de Savos. Because the sur the surname is um, the territory you're from. Um, I can I can tell you. So, freeborn names follow the pattern of first name, family, and tribe. So, um, ah, tribe. I'll, yeah. So. I guess tribe is like a hall in football into Um Yeah, so that would be the group that your character belongs to. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's really handy if you're struggling to think about what. Obviously, if you had a brass coaster called Steve, it'd be a bit out of place, <laughs> maybe. So this gives you a kind of a, a a guide, a guideline of how you should go about it to keep in brief. Because brief is important. Yeah, the so, yeah. brief has to be there so people can distinguish which so nation, nation you're from. Yeah, exactly. So, naming. <clears throat> so, I just thought the name side of it was a really cool thing to have in the wiki because it just gives you an idea of what you're doing. Because, yeah, you don't you don't want to get it all wrong and feel yeah. a bit silly in the field, maybe. Yeah. So each each nation will will differ vastly from their naming conventions. Um, we're going to cover every single nation in future videos and we'll, I guess, look at archetypes and naming uh, conventions for, for each of those uh, yeah. as we go. Yeah. Don't know. I don't think we need to go into much greater detail for the purpose of this. Um, no, we just, don't just know that the wiki is your best friend when you're making your character. Mm -hmm. um, you also don't have to have an archetype. You need to add as well. Um, you can have no archetype. Ah, didn't know that. But, mm. Yeah. Uh, and again, this is all stuff that after your first event, if you want to change anything, PD are very good at uh, letting you uh, letting you changing change stuff around. Um, but yeah, I don't know if we've I don't, we haven't actually covered archetypes yet, have we? Um, archetypes are um titles. Would you say? I'm trying to think of like our Wintermark archetypes. So say traditions or um So Lucan's archetype is Thane, mm -hmm. which is looking after the hall. So I guess if we were to sort of go through the archetypes. So Corsair, <clears throat> which is the one I quite like. Corsair is an archetype which is sort of um, So so we're talking specifically about Brass Coast now. Yes, Brass Coast archetypes. Um I did just have the page up. I'm just going to have a look for it now. Mm. 
Um, yeah, so the Corsairs are sort of daring adventurers. Again, like sea captains, um, sort of seeking opportunities for trade and excitement for and defending both freeborn and imperial interests at sea. So I think it'd be quite cool as sort of a privateer, privateer character type thing to be a Corsair. So that's sort of like that archetype. Obviously, there's there's six archetypes with the freeborn. Um, <clears throat> You've got like the Kohan, which are warriors without family, which um, maybe they're. So they're warriors. So again, if you were going to be a warrior or something like that, maybe you want to pick this one. Um, again, I guess I don't want to massively go into it, but. Um... I guess all we suggest for new players is to. If you fancy the idea of an archetype, just read through it on the wiki, yeah, um, <coughs> and so, um, see yeah. if you like the sound of it. So I guess, um, sorry, I was just looking at another archetype as well. This there's one that kind of is for priests, right? So Wintermark has it, priests, and there'll be storm crows. Freeborn have got their own. So if you're going to be a freeborn priest, you'll probably want to pick this archetype, that archetype, because that's to do with priests. Well, which one um, is that? The Sutanir. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and then you've got... Okay, so you've got Scriveners, Scriveners, which are down to... They, they kind of make financial agreements and stuff like that, and they deal with the exchange of goods and whatnot. Um, so, again, like, obviously just look through them, but you're going to find, yeah, it'll cover most of the things. Um, there's, yeah. for example, there's another one which is to do with magic. So you kind of got magic priests and then a few other ones in there, warriors and a few others. So, yeah, um, types is going to be one. Or like you said, you just don't pick one. Yeah. Or you um, can uh, change your archetype at a later date. So when we yeah. went to our first event, um, Tom and I, neither of us had an archetype and he um, became banner bearer. I think at I think maybe uh, I don't know if it was at the event or after and I basically I think it might have been at the event because he went to like a military meeting and I was like well what the hell do I do <laughs> so I was just stood around probably looking like a lost puppy and then um, we heard about the Thanes meeting and I was just like well shall I just go I'll just go and see what's going on and that's how I became Thane. And that was after we went so it's it, you can you don't have to have it all planned out i guess is, is what i'm saying in a roundabout way um sometimes things in your role-playing journey will happen to you that develops your character naturally into a role um just answering this what is an archetype an archetype represents a social niche that your character can occupy Something that your character is first and foremost known for. There you go. That's what yeah. an archetype is. And again, like every nation has one. Maybe certain nations will have focus on a certain aspect of the game, perhaps. Um, <clears throat> so, for example, the Brass Coast have one about fleets and ship captains. Being a Corsair, Wintermark doesn't have that. Hmm. But Wintermark has mystics and stuff like that. Whereas... I'm not sure. I, yeah, I think. Anyway, yeah, what I'm trying to say is different. Like, again, look, you look at um, uh, Varushka or something like that. They've got some other cool archetypes which aren't necessarily anything to do with other nations and stuff. So it's it's just to give um, a bit more feel to a nation that separates them from other nations. Yeah. Um, and again, I guess RP wise, it gives a player something to select and kind of pursue and keep with. So if you select a Corsair or whatever, then you've kind of got an idea of where you should be following when it comes to being a character, you know? Yeah. Um, it just gives you some direction if you need it. Yeah. And again, it's sort of a mechanical thing for fan decisions as well, I believe. But yeah. And it just gives your character a bit of extra flavour. Yeah. Yeah. And it helps, again, the next section of writing down backgrounds, it gives you something to work with. Yeah. 
Now, if that wasn't enough choice for your character, there's also lineages. Mm -hmm. um, basically, lineage is, uh, I guess, the the empire equivalent of having uh, different character races, isn't it? But you're all you're all humans, but uh, you can be magically touched by one of the realms of of magic, essentially, and that's that's why a, a, a lineage will um, present itself uh, from within you if you are if you decide to be lineage um so there's six to choose from and they each uh they're each associated with one of the six realms of magic um which we haven't covered yet but we will cover in uh the magic episodes um but yeah you can basically choose to be lineage if you like um should we do you want to alternate going through each lineage I'm, or do you, I can just list them all quickly. I guess list them all quickly. I, again, the wiki's there for it, but maybe if you just list them and give a quick what you. Think yeah, I think I think the the wiki is actually really good for the lineage um, mm -hmm. info because it's sort of all on one page. Um, but you you have briars, which mm -hmm. um, you normally see that manifesting as bark skin. I, I'd say that's probably the most common um, yeah. thing to come out of it. Um, I don't know if this has got any extra bits about um, how they... Their spring realm. Apparently. Yeah, so each lineage... Yeah, their spring realm. They'll have... They'll each ha each lineage will have iconic trapping. So in this case, it's um, bark skin for, um, for briars. Um, and in addition to looking different, you'll have uh, role-playing effects that you you can either play up to or... or downplay as much as you want um so i think briars I, I can't find it on the wiki but i'm pretty sure they are um a bit more like direct and blunt um but there's there's a there's massive pages for each one um but yeah that's briars um then you have uh they're not in order of realm unfortunately uh changelings which are touched by the realm of summer um, the one trapping that I see most often for changelings is uh, the antlers. Um, we have our first lineage person in the hall. Uh, pointed ears is a major trapping. Sorry? Pointed ears, sorry. For... for a changeling? Yeah. Don't often see that though, but I'm not very observant. Um, yeah, we have a changeling in the hall now, don't we? Young Master Tor is a changeling, I believe. Yep, first lineage. Um, yeah. yeah. Then we have Cambians, which I was going to say physically similar, but they're not really physically similar at all. They have massive horns, like massive curled, like ram's horns, is the 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 most common trapping that I see on a on a Cambian. Um. I don't know if there's any other ones. I will have a quick look. Uh, oh, curved horns. They've got additional horns, metallic eyes, metallic skin, metallic talons, well, that's, labyrinth marks. Yeah, that's that's, that's not their iconic trappings, though. That's just yeah, that's other things other, they can have. That's other trappings, yeah. Iconic trappings are horns, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you don't, For example, they're saying if you don't have an iconic trapping, so if you're not going to have horns as a cambion, <clears> um, you have to have one of the other additional trappings. Yeah, um, I was going to say, I don't think I've ever seen a Cambion without horns, but I wouldn't know. Um, so I think if you're going to if you're gonna play a lineage, you should probably aim to have the iconic trapping at least a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, otherwise, you're just, you're just, well, I mean, it doesn't really matter. You're only indulging yourself, but then what's the point of being lineaged if it's only you that knows, you know? I guess if you do the other trappings really well, though... Um... Like from from I don't know enough about lineage people, but if I saw a Cambion now, like if I saw someone walking around with like metallic skin and metallic hair, then I would know that they're a Cambion because that's part of their other trappings, you know. So I yeah. guess it's I I just don't know enough about lineage to really know what's what. So, but now I sort of do. But again, it's down to how much everyone else knows about lineage. Yeah, maybe we just need to learn more about lineage. <laughs> 
I think that's the general consensus when it comes to <laughs> the Empire. Not not being that supportive of lineage people. Yeah, spoiler alert for everyone watching, we are the worst people to be doing these kinds of informative podcasts. <laughs> Actually, I'm, I've been quite, this is a tangent, but I, I, I've been pleasantly surprised by, I think, both of our knowledge so far. We've learned more than, or I've learned more than I thought. Appearing like we know. <laughs> Just memorising the wiki every night leading up to these. Um, and then the Realm of Winter, we have the Draugr, which uh, the iconic look is very pale skin with black, like, cracked uh, eyes, like the eye paint. Um, Prominent veins is what that is. Red or black veins clearly visible just beneath the surface of their pallid skin. Mm. Um, yeah. They are quite creepy, I guess, if you want. If you look at their other trappings, really quite creepy. Yeah, Predatory, predatory Teeth. Mm. And, and eyes. eyes. Mm. Clawed fingers. Ooh. <laughs> um, but I have seen some really good um, Draugr makeup and stuff mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in the field. Tons of them, but yeah. Um, and then we move on to the uh, the final two realms of of magic, uh, day and night. Um, we have Meros for the realm of day, which are. Our, uh, I was going to say fish people, but that's um, that's a tr that's a drastic oversimplification of. Uh... <laughs> In fact, there is a what they are not section for each of these, like we talked about last week with the the nations, and one of, the, not, uh... one of the things it says they are not is fish people. So, apologies, mm. Meros of Empire. I mean, they have webbed fingers, fins, scales, <laughs> and gills. Yeah, just not strictly fish people. Because they're yeah. human. They're not fish. Yes. They ain't fish, they're marrow. Kevin Gosner from Waterworld. <laughs> uh, so yeah, the iconic trapping for, for them is gills and stuff. And um, generally, I see a lot of um, ears. Like, um, it's hard to describe, like seahorse finned ears. I see that quite a lot in the yeah. field. Um, I guess um, it's quite a cool lineage because, yeah, you can kind of go real quite fancy with it, with, like, the fish stuff. Like, yeah, I, th I think we've seen, again, the same with Naga, seen some real big um, lineage stuff, which, yeah, it's kind of pretty mind -blowing. There's them. There's that one guy who's kind of got, like, tentacle moustache. Yeah. Which, yeah, it's kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, it's the the effort to, to go through to have that on yeah. is commendable but i couldn't do it <laughs> yeah, I'm, so, I'm so far too lazy if i was going to be lineaged it would have to be something that can stay on all weekend well like a lot of people go for scales because that's just a bit of makeup yeah you know? um scales kind of an easy one i like the idea of prosthetic bark skin but it's whether it mm. would stay on i guess if it's like if it's a patch on your face and it mm. unsticks every night then that's not too bad but um I've got ways of I would, how I would do certain lineages, which I'm going to talk about next when we go to Naga. Yeah. Because this is a character concept I got. Or did I? Yeah, that is a, a lovely segue into the final of the lineage, which is Naga, which are the snake people. No, <laughs> I'm, I'm, sure it says, I'm sure it probably says that they are not oh, snake people. You can call them that. It doesn't say you're not allowed to call them that. So <laughs> They... <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, well, yeah, the snake people then. No, um, they are snake-like in terms of um, traditionally scales. Um, I think the iconic trapping is scales. Yeah, scaled brow or eye sockets. Mm -hmm. um, did you say your next character is going to be Naga? I, uh, so I had a Naga lined up, but I have now drifted onto Imperial Orc. But yeah, I would have done oh, Naga. Yeah. And um, another cool thing with Nagas as well, you say like reptilian eyes, like scale skin, like rep like snakes. Um, mm. They can have feathers as well. Yes. Which is really cool. I've seen a few feathered, and I thought like, what lineage is that? I had no idea. Turns out, yeah, it's Naga. 
Because mm. I've seen one is basically like a parrot, which was really cool, like real colourful feathers. Um, and yeah, that's Naga, which, yeah, so really nice. Um, the goal is to look like a feathered serpent, not a scaled bird. There you go. Um, so yeah, really, really cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, so here's my thinking with this, which I guess you could apply to maybe Meros and stuff. But do a bit like a an orc mask, a balaclava mask, where you'd have sort of like, so you could literally pull it on, maybe face paint your eyes and mouth, but yeah, literally pull it on and then take it off at the end of the day, rather than sort of applying lots of bits. And you could do that with Mero as well. Like if yeah. you were quite heavily lineaged, you could do it with Mero. Um, that's how I would tackle that. And maybe like, you know, coloured gloves to cover your hands. Because if, if I was going to go Naga, I was going to go green. In fact, I need to show the picture. Um, you talk about a full mask. Yeah. That is, it's, it's a bit small, apologies, but um, that is a full Naga mask, which looks very cool. I did just notice as well that I just clicked the identity button and it goes to a dead page. Yes, the lineage button. Yeah, I figured that out earlier, which... Yeah, I'm surprised no one's noticed that. Maybe we'll email PD. Come on, PD. Come on, Matt P. No. Come on, Matt P. Um... So yeah, so, that's lineage. Yeah, that's lineage covered. So again, this um, had a lot to think about when you're picking, and this is all. Yeah, it's all. It's all going to influence everything, really. So obviously, when you're picking one, you might then therefore think, oh, maybe I choose something different. I don't know. Or maybe you've got an idea in your head from the start, and that's fine. So, but again, we got the wiki. So. Mm. Yes, the little question mark doesn't work, but you can just search up lineage, and you'll get there. So, yes. And then I guess let's lead us on to the next one, which is groups. Yep. So do you I'd mind forgot, I'd forgotten about all this. Yeah. Do you want me to rattle through groups quickly? Yes. So um, groups, three main things. This obviously depends what character you've selected. We've just gone for sort of a warrior type person, haven't we? Sort of Corsair dude. So at the very top is Banner. Now this is a generic word used each nation has a different name for it so i think in the brass coast it's called families no tribes sorry mm, families so in wintermark um, there's a hall so this is a group of people so we've got birch and hall that's a, a hall and that would be a banner um in the brass coast for example um <clears throat> someone's gonna tell me in a minute um it was it was Plan or something, wasn't it? When we read the yeah. name being brief, I thought I thought it was family. Family. But, um, and yeah, so this is going to be a hall essentially. So that for everyone, everyone who has a group out there, that's when it's going to come under. Um, I'll be able to tell you now. I don't know why I'm that fixated on it. Family. I think it's family. We need to know. Um, anyway, so yeah, you've got your banners. So by choosing one of them, obviously these are pre-made groups here. These are people's groups. So in theory, you can go on to banners and select one of them and that's it. But um, that's someone else's group they have in the game. So if you don't know anyone before joining a banner, just leave it blank. You can go in without a banner. That's fine. Mm -hmm. But I don't think some people might out there might not appreciate a random person being mechanically assigned to them on the banner. So I always thought it was a bit random that you had access to every group in that nation um, because you know you could literally join some random person at all. Um, but I yeah, guess it's the always... only way to do it, really. Um, well, actually, no, because you would just you go just... to a ref in game. You just leave it blank, um, and you're either you're either joining the game already part of a hall because they're mates that's where you just select that hall or you go in blank you find a hall you like in game and you get assigned that way um so that's what banners are they're, they're groups um that players have made then you've got covens and sects so covens to do with magic so um if you're a magician you'll join a coven and therefore you can kind of do big group ritual stuff mm -hmm. together um so that's where covens come under again same principle um if you if you if you don't know anyone part of a coven and you're not part of a coven and you're starting as uh you know your first event you're probably not going to select one of them because you don't know any covens 
Yes. Um, but again, if, if you're making a new character and you're going to join it, that, that's where you select it. Or again, you just find it in the field, you join a coven in the field, you go um, to the, basically get bonded to that coven. So, um, bound. And then sects are the same thing, they're just religion. So they're not magic, they're religion. And exactly the same principle. They're all sat there on the, the drop down. Yep. Um, but yeah, exactly what I explained before. So, you can belong to one of each. of each. In theory, yeah. So um yeah, so you can join a banner and a coven. So I'm part of a banner and a coven currently. Yeah. Um, and if I had any religiousness to me, I would be part of a sect if I wanted to join one. So um yeah. <clears throat> I guess for again the wiki's there for it, but it's all self-explanatory groups, you know. Unless if if you and your mates um, are joining first group, uh, first time together, you might make a group ahead of time, which you do in the same page as character creation. Just before that, you can create an empire group, which uh, maybe we'll do an episode on one day. Um, yeah, as it, probably the same setup as this, but you just make a group and then it'll be there, and that's it. Yeah, so that, that's groups. Very brief, but that's it. There you go. Um, Brass Coast is a family. It is a family, okay, yeah. So we have halls, they have families, Vrushka will have something, League will have something. Um, yeah. You know, so... Houses in Dawn. Houses in Dawn, yeah. I feel like I can... I know the League-ish one, but um, I don't want to say. Because I might probably have one. Um, <laughs> we'll cover it when we get there. Yeah. Um, so I guess the next bit is character questions. So I guess these are questions that... PD this, uh, there for you to answer to maybe help you flesh out your character yeah this this final bit really i would say is entirely optional um but it's massively important if you as a person want to get involved uh in potential plot and just for the rp of it really um the, the without going too much into it the the specific background that that tom um, put together for Birchen Hall when we first started out basically enabled us to just from where we chose to have it um, enabled us to have some potentially really good plot that we ended up messing up but that's a story for another time uh, messing up in character um, so it's, it's, it's really it's really good to have if you're a kind of person who's looking to have potential involvement with uh, with PD sanctioned plot I would say but it's also the area that I guess we can't really help with that much we can go through the we can go through the questions and stuff um, yeah, there we go. but um, it's going to be entirely down to what your character backstory is going to be I, I can't yeah it's been a while since I've looked at these questions but looking at them now very weird questions the first one, not that weird. What's mm. your character's main IC goal? So what's your character's main in-character goal? So, like, for my character, I might put, put, oh, he wants to do lots of trading, become rich, and try to be a senator one day. That's what I would put. Mm. Um, what, what I don't do think you know um, this is obviously Brasco specific, though. What, those questions are specific, are they? I'd have thought so. I'll tell you what. Here we go find out. Because if, if they Old are... confirmation. Hold for confirmation. Let's go on Winterman. Oh, well, I'll just change to Winterman. Oh, here. you're right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah? You're right. Yeah, they're, they're character specific. Okay, because as I said, the, the Brass Coast one was really odd. But maybe that's because it's deliberately done that. I don't know. For Presumably, example, it holds more weight if you've been married in. Uh... Yeah, I, that's what I thought was weird. Mm -hmm. Are you or have you ever been married? But maybe marriage is a big thing in Brass Coast. So yeah, because I definitely didn't answer these questions. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I didn't realize. I was gonna say I didn't realize nations had all different ones, and I thought that's really weird that it would be like, have you ever been married before? <laughs> What's that got? What's that got to do with anything? <laughs> <sighs> so um, yeah, that's okay. Fair enough. Uh, the Wintermark one seems a <clears throat> bit more. What were the Wintermark ones? Well, the Wintermark one is... Um, the last one is, have you ever been named by a Scot? Which is obviously a big thing for Wintermark, fine. But unless you go in with a pre-named name... Oh, yeah, that was it. Yeah, have you been named? Because 
I've been named now, but how do I... I guess i got to email PD to get them to change it. Well, um, it's, it's perfectly acceptable to be like, yeah, I've been named, I'm yeah. Craig the Mighty. <laughs> but it, it doesn't... It's not fun to do that, is it? It's uh, just technically possible. It's not fun for me and you, but maybe it's fun for someone else. It, um, it, it might be, yeah, that's true. I shouldn't assume. You, if, if, you, mark, if you want to go in having already achieved all of your goals, you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Wintermark is, is your character a Steiner, Suak, or Calbessi, which is the Wintermark traditions? And yeah, his last question is, has you, have you earned a name from the Scop? Which, yeah, right. Okay, cool. So, um, so the, I'd say this the, one, the Brass Coast, other than the last one, is much more broad. The questions are much more broad. Yeah, but maybe, maybe again, maybe this is trying to give you a bit more... Um, Mm. Apart from the yes or no answer to, have you been married? <laughs> yeah, no. Um, yeah, that's weird. But uh, I mean, I again, this this these questions might actually be very clever when you're looking at. They're um, obviously there for a reason. The Brass Coast, yes, exactly that. So, um, yeah, I guess like you said, we can't really help too much on this bit because it's sort of down to individual people but i guess we could put in ours we want to sail a boat and be a famous privateer you know that's probably not good enough for brass coast really but yeah then i guess what do we relish most in life i don't know piracy um yeah being on the sea feeling the the sea breeze running through our hair um, have ever been married only 12 times before. <laughs> it's probably I'm married uh, to the sea. Yeah, my one and only true love is the yeah. sea. Obviously, we're being very silly here. It's it's better yeah. to put as much info as you can um, just yeah. to maximise your chance of getting decent plot. Which I... Yeah, I don't know how much that's going to pull plot-wise, but yeah, definitely do it. Um, and then background is you've got 2,000 words, 2,000 characters of personal um, background for your character. So I guess you can just jot some of down. I never did anything. F well, my current character, I actually made at an event. So I died. I had no backup character. So I went to the god tent, quickly slapped something in. So I think mine's like, oh, he's a fleet captain. And that's it. Um, which obviously there's more to my character than that. But obviously... Yeah, look at him now. Maybe... Maybe I should go back and change that at some point. I don't know. But... Your homework between now and the next video is to go and update your backstory. It's a shame because I've never been good at homework. <laughs> um, but yeah, back back again. I guess this is all great for you to kind of start thinking about what your character is before you go into an event. Um, yeah. So the background and the questions is just going to really give you a direction for your character going into an event. Or maybe you want to write write something into your background or your character questions that might give you something to do on your first few events. You know, maybe you you were wronged or, you know, you, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I don't know off the top of my head, but yeah, you could, you could have something in there that just gives you something, maybe an angle that you want to work on perhaps, or maybe you'd be like, ah, oh, you know, um, your ship run aground and now you're, uh, now you want to kind of, rebuild your, your fleet and then that might give you sort of an angle where you're going to write i'm going to now spend my first few events trying to acquire the money to upgrade my fleet because that's where i'm at so yeah and i think i think as well it um how you answer it i think a bit depends on how new you are to to the system so i think for a lot of new players it's perfectly acceptable to to have a background a basic background along the lines of you know, I've been doing this back at the homestead uh, or mm -hmm. whatever it's called in your nation. Um, but I've been tasked with going to Anvil uh, and getting our family's name out there more, which is, I think that's essentially what Tom and I did, did started out with. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a great way of uh, having your character backstory as genuinely not knowing really how Anvil works. So you're going to Anvil for the first time, but you've got this little bit of backstory about what you've done up to that point. Um, I think that that's a, a good way for newer players to approach it. And then once you have the experience of a few characters under your belt, um, 
then you start to come up with more unique scenarios. It's exactly the same. I've personally found it with D&D. Like, my first character was very bog standard. But the more characters I play, the more unusual their backstories become. I was about to say as well, like, maybe people coming from a D&D background might find this a lot easier. <clears throat> like, for, for, for me, for example, I'm not. So I, I just don't know what to write on there. So that's why my character hasn't really got anything written there. And I wouldn't say there's any downside to not having anything written in there yeah you know, yeah i'm not sure if that background is purely down for you um or maybe it's down to possibly there is there is plot yeah. potential in what you put in this information yes there is so i'm looking at it now when you submit your background um the plot team will basically take a look at it <clears throat> so if you if you were like oh yeah i you know, I killed three throne guard before I headed to Anvil, then you might find, potentially, um, you get, like, a warrant for your arrest on your first event or something mad like that. Maybe. I don't know. I don't, if I was writing plot, that's what I would do. So, um, yeah, I guess they, they will look at it. Again, like you said, that's what's happened with Birchen Hall when you first made it. You, you wrote into it about some stuff that happened and then you got pulled into plot which is to be honest is the first time i've ever heard of that happening from my limited experience back back way when so i'm sure um, it happens elsewhere but yeah i've not seen it happen but it did happen to us and the dunnings at the same time because I, of our hall's mm -hmm. fictitious had, location to where the plot was happening i had some plot once but that i think that was purely down to me being a sea captain but I had a plot once where I got a letter from someone that was going to be... It basically it was a conjunction on the field um, mm. through the Sentinel Gate, which um, I was fairly fresh at the time, so I was pretty nervous trying to do anything. So I tried yeah. to tag on in it, and it was like a six-person conjunction. So this one person took lead and then took their mates, so I didn't get on it. But um, uh. yeah, I've had plot that way, which, again, I don't think that was down to backstory. But uh, anyway, so yeah, background could be interesting. Again, yeah, like careful what you put in there i guess because it will be checked by the plot team and then potentially something done about it so you know yeah it's cool um mm. and that is how you make a character and that's as simple as that but obviously if anyone has further questions about um how to get going with with a starter character we now have the means to be able to answer that in the Discord, where Discord? Yeah, so check check that out. Check yeah, Discord out. Um, and again, I I guess we're, hopefully this is going to be useful to anyone kind of coming to Empire. Unsure. Again, I don't. Yeah, we, we've kind of gone a sort of a skin or, or a bit of a deeper dive into character creation, but hopefully you kind of got an idea on what you're doing. Hmm. And maybe having someone else talk about it, like I find it quite useful, you know, someone else talking about it and having their thoughts on it kind of helps me understand things. So hopefully it's done the same. And obviously these streams we're doing are going to be checked onto YouTube so you can go back and watch them. But until the next video, have uh, an amazing two weeks. We'll be back in two weeks with the next video. Um, but I'm sure we're going to throw up a few more stories and stuff in between um, just to stay in contact with you guys. Um, so until then, have a wonderful time. Bye.